Good morning, everyone. So thank you. I'm going to be giving a very brief presentation. I titled it Cautionary Tales from the Geriatric Literature, and I was inspired to give this brief commentary or a brief example uh, just as an educational piece for us to think about uh, the importance of critical appraisal and reading the literature carefully. And from time to time, I might do a couple of these uh, over the next year, depending on how people uh, see them and see whether they're valuable. Next slide, please. Thanks, Barb. So my objective is simple. It's really to highlight the importance of carefully reading and critically appraising studies or really reading beyond the abstract. We know that 80% of people read the abstract and nothing more, and sometimes that's enough, particularly if the paper is deemed of low quality or relevance. But if we are going to implement changes in our practice or we're going to update our knowledge base, then many times we need to read deeper to really understand and make sure that the studies actually uh, do find what they purport to find. Next slide, please. So here's an example. This paper was published in JAGS uh, last fall. It's titled, A Home and Community-Based Occupational Therapy Improves Functioning in Frail Older People, A Systematic Review. And no criticism is meant at the authors, but when I read this paper, I thought it was instructive for the reasons I'll show you in a moment. Next slide. So here's the brief summary of what they did. Their objective was to assess the effectiveness of occupational therapy to improve performance in daily living activities in community dwelling, physically frail older people. And the design, and I've highlighted the key elements, it's a systematic review and meta-analysis. They included RCTs, reporting on occupational therapy as an intervention or part of a multidisciplinary approach. They followed the Cochrane methodology, which all sounds good. Next slide. Their results were they found nine studies that met inclusion criteria, and they found reasonable quality with a low risk of bias. The bottom line is there was a significant increase or improvement in all primary outcomes. And then they go on to report the outcomes, that there is a pooled result, meaning they combined the studies and showed improvements in daily living activities, social participation, and mobility, all with occupational therapy interventions, and all the secondary outcomes showed positive trends. And the bottom line conclusion, I'm sorry, it's cutting off on my screen, but the suggestion is there's strong evidence that occupational therapy improves uh, functioning in frail older adults, or some wording to that effect. Next slide. So what's the problem with the study? It sounds good, the abstract seems reasonable, we believe it, it's consistent with what we think of in occupational therapy, but let's dig a little deeper. The first cautionary tale is who did they include or, or what studies did they include? More importantly, they excluded studies where older people were receiving any form of rehab, which included institution-based daycare or home-based rehab. Uh, if the main diagnosis was an acute problem like pneumonia or heart failure exacerbation, if people had a diagnosis of dementia, and then they had a, a number of small other exclusion criteria. So my first challenge with this paper is I don't understand the OT intervention. I understand many of the studies that were removed but it's not so clear what the interventions were that they included. But that's not the biggest problem. Let's move to the next slide. If you actually look critically at the nine randomized trials, here's the crux. In fact, only one of the nine included studies was uh, a randomized trial of an occupational therapy monodisciplinary intervention by Clark and colleagues, their second reference. And that study did not have, for whatever reason, enough data or data points or enough numerical quantitative data to be included in the meta-analysis for any of the actual outcomes that they reported. And the meta-analysis also did not and could not really separate whether the occupational therapy was what was effective or was it part of the broader black box of interventions or was the OT part ineffective and it was the rest of the interventions that led to the effects. So next slide. At the end of the day, the bottom line is that the conclusions that occupational therapy is effective are based on randomized trials of multiple interventions that include multidisciplinary modality, but in fact, not a single one of the studies was a pure occupational therapy intervention, and not one of the studies separated the effects of occupational therapy from other modalities, and they were all multimodal studies. So in fact, there's actually no strong evidence to support or refute whether occupational therapy is effective, and I believe that the conclusion is actually fundamentally flawed. And I would have rejected this paper or demanded that they significantly revise it um, if I were the, the reviewer or the editor. 
So bottom line is, reader beware, the devil is in the details. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shabir. And, and just a reminder that we'll take questions for Shabir's uh, short presentation after Richard does his. We're just going to switch over the slides now. Uh, do people see Richard's uh, first slide, personal sound amplification? Eric, can you just confirm that you see our slide personal? Yes, we can see the slides. Terrific, thank you, go ahead. All right, okay, thanks everybody for this opportunity. I'll be presenting on the paper, Personal Sound Amplification Product versus a Conventional Hearing Aid for Speech Understanding and Noise. Uh, I have no disclosures. Um, in terms of, uh, we know that hearing loss is very common in older adults and certainly has been associated with a number of uh, negative uh, sequelae, including uh, decreased cognitive functioning, social isolation, um, it's unclear whether hearing aids mitigate this, but it's certainly one of the interventions that we offer to our patients. And previous research has shown that 14, only 14% 14 of eligible older adults, that's adults aged over 50 in this case, uh, actually um, go all the way through to have an ear, uh, hearing aid fitted and actually use it. Um, so that suggests that there's a, an opportunity for improvement. One of the barriers that's been identified to this in the past is the high cost of hearing aids. Um, they can be anywhere from around $1,500 to $8,000 per year, which for most people, uh, I would say, is a difficult uh, cost to bear, and uh, in many cases are not covered by insurance, either through the government or private. Um, part of the reason that they've uh, been identified as so expensive is that um, they're defined currently as medical devices with heavy regulatory burden associated with that, and so there's a relatively small group, actually, of only four manufacturers who make uh, the vast majority of products worldwide. And they're sold on a service model where you actually pay upfront for all of the follow-up with an audiologist through the life of the hearing aid as um, uh, part of the initial uh, lump sum payment. Uh, and the companies at least say that they need this to pay for the heavy patent burdening and uh, uh, licensing associated because of the small industry. Uh, Ontario does provide a little bit of support through the uh, assistive device program but um, that's only a kind of a percentile uh, um, improvement. Uh, and the reason that this paper um, came to the fore is because the FDA is soon going to be introducing legislation regarding what they call a personal sound amplification product, which we'll get into in a moment, which are look like hearing aids, but are not quite the same thing. Um, so this is some examples of uh, what we're talking about. You can see they look like uh, kind of conventional hearing aids. Uh, the price is much different. They uh, average with something like 250 to $500. There's no testing or fitting associated with their use. You can buy them off the internet and just stick them in the air just like you would a pair of earbuds <laughs> or something. Um, and that's a pro and a con, and then it means that you don't have to go through an audiologist, but you also don't get a hearing test necessarily as part of, of the fitting. Um, they're gener generally only an amplifier. They amplify noise. They do not necessarily have the same degree of sophisticated um, uh, signal processing that uh, is available in hearing aid products, although that is somewhat changing. Um, increasingly, they have apps that you can use on a phone that will allow you to set it to different, um, different uh, modes for like restaurant versus home use and so forth. Um, and they actually, because they use uh, consumer off-the-shelf electronics that are common in other electronic devices, they are incorporating features that are not necessarily available in many hearing aids. So for example, Bluetooth connectivity with a cell phone to uh, allow you to answer the phone through the hearing aid. Um, they may not have support for the telefoil standard, which is an older standard that hearing aids use to um, uh, kind of dial in to pre-install things and say in auditorium, churches, et cetera, where um, you can hear an, a speaker through a microphone directly into your hearing aid. Uh, and they use rechargeable batteries generally, which has a pro and a con in that it's more convenient, but they may not last for a full day, which for some people would be uh, potentially disruptive. And the key key difference is that they are marketed direct to consumer, that you don't get them through an audiologist. It's an example from the Wire Cutter, which is a consumer website. And this is actually saying, a, this, for whatever reason, this very young man is uh, looking for a personal sound amplification product, and uh, they're giving recommendations um, uh, for what you can buy over the internet. Uh, so this is a paper. And um, in terms of what the population they looked at, they looked at a convenient sample of older adults. Um, who attended a university-affiliated audiology clinic. 
Um, the intervention that they looked at um, in this uh, study was a comparison of five different PASP products versus a kind of medium range hearing aid that, they, um, that was popular in their clinic. Uh, and they um, did the performance on the AZ Bio uh, sentence and noise test, which was basically they pump in a bunch of noise into the person's ear and see if they can repeat sentences uh, appropriately. Um, the inclusion study, uh, inclusion criteria for the study include adults aged 60 to 85 with mild to moderate hearing loss. They give relatively few details about how they define that. Um, they uh, excluded people who had previously used a hearing aid or other amplification device and uh, those with cognitive impairment as defined by an MFC greater than 24. Uh, it used a crossover design um, where actually all participants were exposed to all devices. So each of them had uh, unaided hearing, a hearing aid, and all five test devices. And they um, uh, designed the um, experiment using a Latin square design, which we can talk about at this time, to uh, try to uh, avoid um, carryover bias between the different interventions. And then they used linear mixed effect regression models to assess their, their uh, performance of each device within participants. So as close as it was a table one uh, in this very short article, um, they saw 63 adults initially for screening, 42 adults actually were included, mean age was 71.6 and 67% uh, were female. So uh, this is their result table. Um, I'll highlight that uh, you can see the price difference. The um, uh, conventional hearing aid was $1,900 versus two to $300. Um, or even $30 uh, for the devices that were available. And the, uh, the thing I'll draw your attention to is the improvement. So the, the hearing aid improved the, on the hearing score um, from unaided hearing by 12%. And then three of the, um, three of the uh, over-the-counter PASP products had similar uh, degree of improvement um, uh, on that inventory. One had and no evidence of improvement, and the very cheap one actually worsened performance versus an unaided ear. In terms of uh, briefly critically appraising this uh, study, uh, it's a randomized design with a crossover component. Um, the patients serve as their own control in this case. Um, I would say, argue that the follow-up was sufficient for the task they were doing, that they were looking at the performance on the, on the AZ Bio test. Um, all, resident, all uh, participants received all exposures, and so I'd say um, uh, they, were equal, they had equal opportunity to be uh, analyzed. It was um, a kind of a weakness of this is almost certainly unblinded. Um, they don't comment on this in their, their uh, documentation, but the devices look clearly different, and um, I'm assuming both experimenters and, uh, and uh, participants would have been able to identify. Um, they used the Latin square um, technique to ensure that all groups uh, had uh, equivalent exposure. Um, it's difficult to comment on the negative treatment effect, magnitude of treatment effect in terms of like a number needed to treat given that it's a continuous outcome, but I would argue that it's likely sig uh, clinically significant and that the performance is similar to a hearing aid, and we of course offer hearing aids to many people with hearing impairment. Um, the confidence intervals are relatively broad in the study reflecting the small size um, of uh, participants. I would argue that these results definitely apply to our patients and that we see many people with hearing loss, many of whom are not using any um, hearing aid at all. Um, the caveat to be, that being that we typically see pe people with presbycusis, but obviously there's a differential diagnosis for hearing loss, and they also don't comment on bilateral use of these devices, which uh, in, many of our, in many cases um, would be necessary. Uh, the treatment's very feasible. You can go buy one right now on your cell phone if you want. Um, uh, Potential benefits and harms remain unclear. Uh, benefits include greater access to therapy and that um, it's easier for people to um, access financially and um, through, by convenience. There is a possibility for misdiagnosis and that somebody presenting with hearing loss who doesn't necessarily go through the conventional system might not be screened for other more concerning causes of hearing loss. Um, and similarly, if somebody kind of is self-managing things, there's an opportunity, they may be missing an opportunity for more advanced uh, follow up later on if uh, we don't uh, uh, identify them or capture them at the initial um, index event of hearing loss. Um, we also don't necessarily understand patient values clearly about this. Certainly, cost and performance seem like reasonable priorities, um, 
We don't know the long-term performance of these devices. For example, if they last for a year, that might be $500 a year, which isn't necessarily cheaper than buying a hearing aid. Um, and uh, there are other concerns, you know, cosmesis, most of these are not particularly subtle looking um, and trying to get more people to use hearing aids, um, you may want it to be uh, um, more uh, kind of dis disguised. Um, but to the extent of satisfying cost and performance uh, values for patients, certainly I think that these devices are promising. Uh, and uh, they are certainly, I think, more less costly access to care is valuable. The bottom line, these devices are around 10 to 50% cheaper than uh, hearing aids. Uh, and in cognitively intact adults, some of these devices, and I emphasize some because some of them actually may worsen device, may, may actually worsen uh, hearing. Some of these uh, devices may offer similar performance to a hearing aid. Um, areas of uncertainty are how generalizable this small study is to kind of the more general population that we see. Um, the consequences of uh, direct-to-consumer marketing that we're not really sure how people will use this information um, and this availability. Will they still see audiologists? Will they seek medical attention? Or will they um, essentially try to manage this on their own just kind of people who do it reading glasses, for example? Um, and how, how will older adults kind of weigh the options? It happens to be that the more expensive ones tend to be much higher performing, uh, whereas the $30 one, for example, was actually worth. Um, when Amazon presents you with 100 choices, um, it can be difficult to necessarily whittle down what the best choice is. Um, and without something like an audiologist to help you fit something appropriate to your hearing, it may, may actually will result in a worse experience than um, none at all. Um, regulation remains unclear. The FDA may, may uh, introduce some uh, quality standards for these devices. Um, but ultimately, kind of to end on an optimistic note, I'm hopeful that these will be kind of come these sort of reading glasses for the ears is what, where, what some uh, observers have kind of described these as these might be a kind of gateway drug to um, better hearing health where people will be able to access things more easily. And uh, with that, I'll open it to questions for myself and Dr. Alibi. Thank you very much, Richard. Are there any questions for either Shabir or Richard? Do, shall we start at St. Mike's? Baycrest? We don't have questions. Sorry? We don't Baycrest? have questions at St. Mike's. Okay, no questions, no questions at St. Mike's. Baycrest? What about in the room with you at uh, Sinai? No questions here. Okay, we have a question for Murray. Go ahead, Murray. I just wanted to add a comment. Uh, someone who is hearing impaired, and I did take my mother to audiology here. The service is excellent. Um, the uh, audiology device, yes, yes, $3,000 in the government case, and, and I'm talking about the higher end yeah. that has you know, a rechargeable battery that you hook up on the yeah, phone, yeah. like your phone, uh, like you recharge your phone. Because for an older person who lives alone, to go and buy these little batteries and then to put them on is a big production. Um, then there's a, the warranty is almost five years. Um, the service from the audiology is exquisite. Those new devices, they can be hooked up to the computer and they can track how much uh, the person is actually using the audiology device and how it has served the person. So there's a whole element of counseling in t uh, and the counseling is not just about the device, it's about uh, coaching the family on how to communicate with the person who's hearing in, impaired. Uh, the whole behavioral approach to communicating to someone who's hearing impaired, and that's priceless. Uh, um, especially in someone who might have a, a beginning of cognitive impairment, making the family aware about the role of noise in um, making communication difficult, uh, the need to um, ma really monopolize the person of face-to-face um, -face communication. So there's a whole coaching, communication, awareness part to communicating with someone who has hearing impairment. Um, so that's just like the other level of having the audiology 
console. And um, we did experience some um, battery malfunction and uh, we were having the service. So to your comment about this living only maybe one year was the other yeah, one yeah. is it so yeah and I uh, this is the yeah I also wonder like um because say somebody you know gets these and they try it and it doesn't work for them will that turn them off like a more sophisticated device later with kind of unclear side effects right so so we're just getting ready for Amanda to take on uh, the uh, control here, but thank you, Marae. It brings in the patient and the user family and patient perspective and experience into the Journal Club, and I think it's a really important perspective for us to keep in mind. So we're gonna move on to the next presentation, and Amanda's got her slides up. Hopefully you're seeing them about methylphenidate. And um, I'll just, I'll just move this so that the, you can sure. speak into the speaker. Yep, go ahead. All right, so hi everyone. Today I'm going to be presenting an article that was recently published in the Journal of American Psychiatry entitled Methylphenidate for Apathy in Community Dwelling Older Adults with Alzheimer's Dementia, a Double Blind Randomized Placebo Controlled Trial. I don't have any conflicts. Um, so, just to brief objectives are to give an overview of apathy in people who have dementia um, and to provide a review and a critical appraisal of the article. So in terms of background, so apathy is an extremely common problem that affects people with Alzheimer's dementia. It's estimated that 70% of people with Alzheimer's will have apathy at some point in their disease course, and it typically tends to persist throughout the disease course. Um, it can occur at any point, and it's associated with functional impairment, actually more functional impairment than the memory impairment itself, and it's also importantly associated with increased mortality. In terms of the definition of apathy, um, it's defined as a loss of or diminished um, motivation compared to the pre patient's previous level of functioning, um, the presence of at least one symptom over um, in two out of the following three domains that persist over the course of four weeks, which includes loss of or diminished goal directed behavior, decreased goal directed cognitive activity, and decreased or diminished, a loss of or diminished emotion. Um, and the symptoms must cause impairment in personal, personal social, and occupational functioning and cannot be due to the direct effects of um, either medication um, or another underlying disorder. In terms of measuring apathy, there are various scales that exist um, to quantify apathy. The most common one used, and the one that's used in this article, um, is the apathy evaluation scale, which is basically an 18-item scale. There's a variety of questions that people are asked about school-directed activity, um, and it's administered by a clinician in conjunction with the patient's caregiver um, and the patient, um, and it's supposed to reflect the previous four weeks. The scores range from 18 to 72, where a higher score reflects increased apathy, and a score of 30 is considered clinically significant, with a change of 3.3 or more to be considered either improvement or worsening of apathy. The instrument has good internal consistency and reliability, and there have been studies validating the tool in people with dementia. So in terms of the underlying pathophysiology of um, apathy, it's thought to be the result of decrease in dopamine, so the loss of synapses and neurons from amyloid and neurofibrillary tangles leads to impair neurotransmission with deficiencies in dopamine and acetylcholine. Um, there have been studies that have shown decreased d 2 like receptor density and lower levels of dopamine transporters in people with Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and then there have also been studies looking at patients with Alzheimer's where they're given a dextroamphetamine challenge and they have decreased response to that. So the current treatment of apathy is quite limited. In terms of non-pharmacologic interventions, there have been a variety of generally short-term studies that have looked at things like music, art, um, reminiscence therapy, skills training, problem solving, cognitive behavioral therapy, and they've shown some short-term benefit but no lasting effects and these things are certainly a hard to implement. Um, in terms of antidepressants, they're either ineffective or actually, interestingly, worse than apathy. Um, and that points to the fact that apathy is distinct from just um, depression itself. Mamantine has been ineffective. There have been various meta analyses <coughs> looking at cholinesterase inhibitors, which are used, apathy is usually a secondary endpoint, and there has been some improvement with cholinesterase inhibitors um, for apathy. Um, but the treatments are generally limited, and that's why new treatments are needed. I just wanted to um, point out, uh, not going to be discussing this study today, but there was actually a very 
um, recent small study looking at repetitive transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation for people with mild cognitive impairment. It was a very small sample size, but did demonstrate some improvement for people with apnea. So in terms of methylphenidate, it's a central nervous system stimulant that blocks presynaptic reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. It's most commonly used to treat ADHD in children and adolescents. Um, and there have been an, uh, several previous small studies that um, I'll highlight that have shown that methylphenidate may have some promise in treating apathy in people with dementia. Um, methylphenidate is a stimulant and is therefore associated with a variety of side effects, including um, increased heart rate, hypertension, it can also lead to psychosis, agitation, um, headache are amongst the most common um, potential side effects, and also um, weight loss. So previous studies, so there was a 2008 um, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial that examined the use of methylphenidate in 13 apathetic patients with Alzheimer's disease, and the subjects in that study demonstrated improvement in apathy compared to placebo on the apathy evaluation scale, but also very small um, sample size that was examined over a short period of time. Another more recent study where Louise Honeybrook was one of the participating states, who states looked at a six-week randomized double-blind placebo-controlled um, trial of um, methylphenidate in people with Alzheimer's dementia and apathy. Um, and in that study, there was a statistically significant reduction in apathy. There were a few people who had adverse effects, including psychosis, um, who had to stop the treatment. So the objective of this study was to test the effects of 12 weeks of methylphenidate on apathy in community-dwelling older veterans with mild Alzheimer's dementia. Um, the secondary objectives were to assess cognition, functional status, caregiver burden, and depression. In terms of the study design, um, I'll go through this in more detail in the next slide. It was conducted um, at the Department of Veteran Affairs Medical Center in Arkansas. Partic participants were recruited by advertisements and then were further screened. So the population consisted of um, men over the age of 60 who had an established diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia. To qualify for the study, they had to have an MMSC that was 18 or greater, a score in the apathy evaluation scale of at least 40, and they had to have either been on stable doses of antidepressants for two months, um, and then if they were on a cholinesterase inhibitor or memantine, they had to be on a stable dose of that for at least four months. The intervention group got methylphenidate initially at a dose of five milligrams POBID for two weeks. Um, and then after the two weeks that they tolerated it, the dose was increased to 10 milligrams POBID um, for um, 10 subsequent weeks. The control group um, got a placebo and the outcome, the primary outcome was apathy measured by the apathy evaluation scale. And then we talked about the secondary endpoints, which were evaluation of cognition, ADL, caregiver burden, and depression. And the study took place um, in Arkansas in the Department of Veteran Affairs Medical Center. In terms of the exclusion criteria, they, um, people were excluded if they were already taking methylphenidate at the time of the study or if they previously had an adverse reaction to methylphenidate, if they were using any other amphetamines, antipsychotics, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which are contraindicated with the use of methylphenidate or clonidine, if they had um, any other type of dementia, aside from Alzheimer's, if they had active depression at the time of the study, active psychosis, a history of uncontrolled seizures, uncontrolled hypertension, um, symptomatic coronary disease, Tourette's, or closed angle glaucoma. So in terms of the participant recruitment, 156 patients were assessed for eligibility, um, and 96 were excluded based on either not meeting the MMSC cutoff or not being interested in participating or not able to participate in the study. And then 60 people were randomized, 30 to the methylphenidate um, arm of the study and 30 to the placebo. And one patient in the placebo group did not receive the allocated intervention. And the follow-up rate was actually uh, more than 90% at all the study visits. So in terms of the baseline characteristics of the study, the mean age was 76 in both groups. 100% of the people were male, the vast majority were Caucasian, um, so about two-thirds in both groups were on a cholinesterase inhibitor, a significant proportion more in the methylphenidate group were on an antidepressant at the time of the study, um, and there were high rates of baseline um, hypertension and depression as well. In terms of the baseline characteristics, you can see that the methylphenidate group had a slightly higher um, baseline score on the apathy evaluation score. The MMSC was about 24 in both groups. Um, and they were otherwise um, uh, similar, just the IADL score was higher in the placebo group. So overall, the placebo, 
the placebo group may have had <coughs> less apathy and higher functioning individuals. So in terms of the results, um, the target methylphenidate dose was reached in all but three patients for whom it was reduced due to hypertension. And the methylphenidate group had a significantly greater reduction in apathy compared to the placebo. There was also um, improvement in the behavior, there was an initial improvement in the behavioral and cognitive domains, um, followed by the emotional domains, but also there was an improvement with people through and just affecting cognition, functional status, caregiver burden, and depression. So this is um, one of the results tables. So you can see um, at four weeks, the methyl, the um, apathy score went down by almost 10 points for the methylphenidate group um, versus um, about four for the placebo group. Um, and then if you look at eight weeks, there was continued reduction um, in apathy scores in the methylphenidate group compared to the placebo group, which remained at baseline. Um, and then um, the other interesting piece, if you look at the mini mental, so they, they assess cognition with both the mini mental, the MMSC, and a modified version of the MMSC that includes a few more detailed tests. Um, if you look at the MMSC scores, they were had both slightly increased at the four-week mark, but in the um, methylphenidate arm, the score had increased, whereas in the placebo group, it actually decreased at 12 weeks. This is just a graphic of the results. You can see the apathy scores went down a little bit in the placebo group, but then kind of stagnated, whereas there was continuous reduction um, in the methylphenidate group. In terms of um, the other secondary measures of the study. Um, so there was a significant um, improvement in activities of daily living, which was measured through a score. Um, there was a significant improvement in instrumental activities of daily living. If you look at the caregiver burnout, there was a significant improvement of that and decrease in depression. And then um, there was no difference in the clinical global impressions improved scale between the two groups. In terms of adverse effects, there was one person in the methylphenidate group who was hospitalized for a seizure, which was felt that could potentially be secondary to the methylphenidate. Um, but there was interestingly no increase in insomnia um, in the methylphenidate group. They commented that there was no significant change in blood pressure, but I just wanted to point out that the systolic blood pressure in the methylphenidate group actually increased by 18 points throughout the course of the study, um, but by nine and by nine points in the placebo group, although the baseline blood pressure was on the lower side. Um, there was no change in heart rate. So in terms of the appraisal, patients were randomized. The randomization was sealed. In terms of baseline characteristics, the methylphenidate group, like we pointed out before, did have slightly more apathy at baseline. The study was blinded and placebo controlled. The follow-up was um, pretty complete. All of the patients were um, probably younger than the patients that we uh, see in um, clinic and on the inpatient service. They were all male, and the average MMSC score was 24, which is higher than most of the patients that we, that we see um, typically. Um, I think that they did consider um, the clinically important outcomes. In terms of whether treatment benefits are worth the harm, um, you know, certainly apathy is a significant problem, um, but some of the adverse outcomes that occur in this study um, are potentially worrisome, particularly being hospitalized for a seizure. Um, is obviously not a good thing, and then there was a significant increase. We saw the increase in blood pressure. In terms of the study weaknesses, um, as I mentioned before, only men were included. Most of the patients in the study were Caucasian, so it's unclear how um, these results generalize to other groups. Um, only patients with mild Alzheimer's disease were included, um, so unclear how much of this translates to people with more advanced disease. The sample size was pretty small. The follow-up was six weeks is still pretty short term. Um, the caregiver information may be subjective and there were no biomarkers included. Um, in terms of additional weaknesses, the methylphenidate group had more apathy at baseline. They didn't examine or control for, they controlled for like antidepressants and splenesterase inhibitor, or they examined the use of splenesterase inhibitors and antidepressants, but didn't control for any non-pharmacologic interventions that may have been going on at the same time. Um, not all of the patients were on a cholinesterase inhibitor, and they didn't comment on other things like pain, physical health, or um, other medications that could have potentially been contributing to apathy. Um, the methylphenidate group had a significant increase in blood pressure, like we talked about before, and then in the long term, um, especially people with dementia weight loss, could be a long term concern. 
In terms of the study strength, it was blinded and placebo controlled. The follow up was longer than that um, which was carried out in previous studies, and few patients were lost to follow up. So, to conclude, this study shows promise for the use of methylphenidate to treat apathy in male patients with mild Alzheimer's disease, but a lo longer, larger, multi center study that includes both men and women and patients with more severe dementia is needed to establish the safety and efficacy of methylphenidate. And currently, there's actually an ongoing study called the ADMET 2 trial. Um, in follow-up to the previous study um, that we talked about, which is going to be a placebo-controlled mass six-month Penn Center randomized trial that will aim to evaluate um, 200 um, participants. So hopefully um, we should have more data in this area coming up soon. So thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Amanda. We'll open it up to questions, and maybe we'll start this time at Baycrest. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Um, as is often the case with small trials, uh, the randomization doesn't really work in terms of creating two groups that uh, are completely well matched on a variety of uh, variables. I was wondering if you could comment on the differences between the groups uh, and um, in what direction you may be concerned that uh, there could be bias related to the uh, the fact that the two groups were different in a variety of characteristics? Um, so I think the main difference between the two groups is that the um, methylphenidate group at baseline had more apathy. I, in terms of what direction that would skew results, um, it's possible that if you have more apathy at baseline, you may be more responsive to the effects of a psychostimulant. Um, and so that um, may have, um, I guess, diminished the treatment effect. Um, there were not, there were no differences in MMSE scores, and the um, placebo group had slightly higher IDL functioning, which may have been related to decreased apathy um, at baseline. There was more antidepressant use in the methylphenidate group. Yeah, that as well. So, I mean, uh, antidepressants have been studied in the past and have actually shown to potentially worsen apathy. Um, so, if there's more antidepressant use in the placebo group, um, I mean, I guess theoretically that could have worsened apathy in that group and, and resulted in greater treatment effect for the uh, methylphenidate group as well. I, I will point out. Not all antidepressants are, are created equal. So for example, uh, bupropion, which is dopaminergic, is often uh, tried in people with apathy with some success. So uh, I'm just pointing out that there, there are uh, areas that we need to be vigilant. For sure, and they didn't comment on the specific antidepressants that were used um, for the patients in the study. Very good. Should we go down to Sinai? Any questions for Amanda? And we can also take questions for the other speakers as well. Uh, no questions from Sina. Thank you, Eric. Oh, we have some questions here. Sharon Strauss. So, Amanda, great presentation. Uh, two methods comments, really. Um, so, first of all, the randomization. It says that the randomization was a block design developed by a statistician using sealed envelopes. So, we would consider that allocation is not concealed in that case. Um, because you can, if, if they said they were opaque envelopes, then I'd be happier, but <laughs> people cheat, and studies have shown that people will cheat because they hold up the envelopes to the light to see which, so that could actually explain the, the difference oh. that you see. So, <laughs> so um, that's one, one comment. And then the second comment is around, I think this would be a very difficult study to get funded in Canada because it was men only, and the CIHR now has, oh. like, they wouldn't fund a study like this that was only targeting men. Now the, the thing is, because this was done in the VA, that's obviously why it was done that way, but, um, but the NIH as well wouldn't fund a study like this. And in fact, the director of the NIH has said that even animal studies, they will not fund unless you include male, like male and female animals. So, um, so I, think it's, I think it's an interesting issue from that perspective as well, because as you've pointed out, we don't know if there's going to be sex differences. There's another question from Marie. A clinical comment. Um, early in my career, I used Ritalin in a patient who died three days after. 
So, you know, I mean, I think we're talking about anxiety, hypertension, but how about death? Mm -hmm. uh, in the context no of hypertension, right? In this setting, there were no deaths, but absolutely, like, sure. the risk of like, seizures was just concerning. I mean, we have the people who are in nursing home, at home, who don't necessarily monitor their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Any questions from St. Mike's? Or um, Camilla, if you're with us, from the Twitter conversation? Oh, uh, Dr. Liu? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hi, it's Jen at St. Mike's. Uh, really nice presentation, Amanda. One question I had for you, because I don't see it here, is was this uh, study registered and was the protocol available? Were you able to find the protocol? Just because my only concern with studies um, like this, especially around adverse events, is, you know, did they report on what they say they were going to report on? Uh, and, and, you know, is, is everything there the way they said it should be? I'm not, I don't think... I. I don't recall reading in the article that it was. I don't think it was registered, but I could be mistaken. I'll have to double check. Okay, just from a point of view of sort of critically appraising it then, that would be another sort of major mark against the story is that I don't know, you know, did they actually um, report on everything they in intended to report on when they first set out on doing this study? For sure. Yeah, I have to double check on that. I don't think they commented on that. Usually that's something to be proud of, right? And a lot of journals wouldn't take a trial unless you've registered it. Any other questions from anybody else who's joining us online? It is registered, clinicaltrials.gov, NCT 004985. <laughs> Janet has been registered. Okay, that, that's good, because yeah, I'll go take a look there later. <laughs> Jen, did you want to comment on why you raised that issue? What your experience has been? Oh my goodness. So, so yes, I've been, um, as I said to, to Sharon yesterday, of the, the mini heart attack that I had whenever, because of course for my uh, systematic reviews for my PhD thesis, it was like a Saturday morning in October whenever I was like cleaning my data and I went on to clinicaltrials.gov and I realized that like safety data, well, trials will be sneaky and they'll say like, oh, we only reported like um, adverse events that were occurring in at least 5% of patients, which to me kind of sounded odd anyway because I was like well okay so what about the adverse events that happen in one percent or two percent of people where, where are those and of course they're uh, pharma sponsored studies so then when I went on to the registry there's like a much more thorough reporting of all the adverse events and like important ones like falls and strokes um, for, for example that were not reported in the paper because they were occurring in fewer than five percent of patients so that's my word of caution to people yeah really good point Shabir, it's Barbara. I, I don't recall, did you mention what journal um, the article was published in that you spoke about at the beginning of Journal Club? The, sorry, Barb, you mean the, the paper itself or the one yes. OT monotherapy paper? The, no, the one, the cautionary tales, which journal, you said that you would have rejected it or asked, asked for um, significant revisions. Which journal was that that it was published in? So the systematic review was in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, so our flagship journal. Oh. Yes, oh. <laughs> 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 it's a point. Hello. Is there are Yes. Uh, it's Gary at Baycrest. Uh, do we have time? Uh, for some reason, I, uh, you weren't hearing me when I had questions with the first two presentations. Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, so, first of all, Richard, uh, thanks for presenting that paper. Uh, I think it's very important for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which, which is kind of interesting, is the increased or growing evidence suggesting relationships between hearing impairment and cognitive impairment. And of course, questions that raises as to whether hearing augmentation may make any difference in that regard. Um, but I did want to uh, speak to a point that you were making uh, and a concern, because obviously we don't want people to stop going to audiology and receiving those services. And uh, I believe at Baycrest, they're actually making these devices available and are helping people make choices. 
because uh, you know the worst possibility is people not getting a hearing augmentation device because they can't afford it. Um, so um, I think there's problems with conflicts of interest uh, with audiology centers that uh, perhaps make more money with hearing aids than they would selling these cheaper devices. So I hope that there'll be more uh, audiology uh, centers that will be willing to uh, uh, make these much cheaper devices available and help people choose ones that uh, that most help them. Um, so I think that's uh, an interesting uh, consideration. Uh, yeah, and hopefully yeah. that. Go ahead. There we are. Yeah, um, yeah, and I. It's interesting to read. There's there's quite a lot of chatter, not surprisingly, in kind of, I don't sort of trade journals, I guess, from from the audiology community where they're they're sussing out these exact issues because it does mean a, a different model for a lot of practices, particularly those who practice privately and are, are built around this kind of it's almost kind of an sort of subscription and installment model, um, and so whether they should be kind of paid commensurately more on for you know their specific services rather than trying to kind of um, kind of roll those costs into the cost of a device. Um, but hopefully, hopefully there there will be something where we can kind of find a happy middle ground where obviously they can afford to maintain a practice but then still offer the advice um, that we know is so valuable. Thank you. And Shabir, I, I wanted to thank you for your presentation. I uh, enjoyed it. And the comment I'd make, because uh, I, I know we've had these discussions in the past, is the failure of editors uh, in peer review journals. Because when you present uh, the paper that you did, to me, that's a gross failure of editorship because uh, they have clearly allowed uh, for the authors of the paper to. Um, provide a certain direction uh, or with their results uh, that are not consistent uh, with what their data actually shows. So it, it does raise, in my mind, uh, major questions about how editors behave because, of course, they want their journals to be widely read. So it's in their interest as well to have conclusions uh, that will get headlines or people will be interested in. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Gary. I mean, people talk about this notion of publication bias, where there's a bias towards publishing positive, important, you know, sounding type studies. And clearly, we all want to see positive studies that advance the literature. Um, but I think that bias is a very powerful one, not only for authors to publish uh, or try to seek publication, but I think journal editors as well. And I think the, the corollary to that, I agree with you completely. I think there needs to be more critical discussion of the responsibilities of editors because just because this article got into JAGS does not mean that JAGS is a, is a bad journal or that New England is good or that CMAJ. I mean, they all have risks. And we've all seen papers in each one of those journals where certain things get emphasized or spun in directions that when you go back and look critically at the data are probably uncalled for or an inappropriate amount of attention is paid to certain findings, but not others. And I think that you're right, we really need to be very vigilant and careful uh, about these things and hold these editors to task as well. Sharon wanted to comment as well. Yeah, so it, I had two comments to follow up. One is I totally agree, and if anybody is interested, David Moore, who's based at the University of Ottawa, is really kind of focused in this area, and he led us on a project to look at core competencies of journal editors that, that's been published in the last year, year and a half. and. Um, and, and also, if anybody's interested, the peer review Congress meeting is where kind of a lot of this discussion happens, which happens every two years. And really, the, the work that David has, has led us on has highlighted that most journals don't get a lot of training. Um, and, and so uh, I think that's one of, the, one of the reasons why you see some of the issues that, that everybody has raised today. And I think it highlights again why, as Shabir mentioned, it's really buyer beware. When we're looking at the literature, we have to be very... Um, very cognizant of this, cognizant of this, and be critic and critical when we're looking at it. So we can't just count on the fact that because it's appeared in a journal that it's going to be high quality. So we have to be able to be skilled in critical appraisal. Um, the second point that I wanted to raise as well is related to this article with Amanda. What did you think about this inclusion about the patient perspective? Um, like from the I think it really biased. Yeah, there's a, there's a blurb, uh, blurb sorry at the end of the article talking about how. Like this 
patient dramatically improves on methylphenidate. It kind of biases the yeah, article, the effects, I think, of the methylphenidate a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. I've never really seen that before. Yeah. Say, aside from like case reports and stuff, which is something with patient perspective, but I've never seen it in like a RCT. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting because, um, I mean, I mean, I can see there's pros and cons because I think it's nice, you know, as Barb was saying, and, and with Murray's comment with, with Richard's presentation, it's nice to hear the patient caregiver perspective, and I think it's, you know, it's a way of doing that. Um, but this is, it, it does make you a little bit worried that it's a little bit raw, raw, like the, the way that it was kind of framed here. Um, but other journals are doing this. So the BMJ will not take your paper unless you include a section now saying how were patients engaged in this project. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yes, and, and to validate what you're saying now, patient centered care. I've been attending the education with Ayelet Cooper. Mm -hmm. I understand that it's not part of the strategic yeah. plan of the university. And I've seen that uh, Canadian Medical Association has put a podcast on patient centered care. But that's now like really, you know, a big buzzword. Uh, the other thing I want to add is Mementi clinically, I have found useful mm -hmm. for apathy. So I don't know where the literature, you know, we probably have some positive, some negative. And again, from patient's perspective, some family reporting the changes in apathy. I just wanted to add that Toronto Central Lynn has this tagline, no no data without stories, no stories without data, mm. as their approach to uh, sort of bringing those two things together. I think Doug wanted to jump in and then let us so in. I think there was a subjective aggregate score, the clinical impression mm -hmm. change, and so that was negative in yes. the study. And so it's interesting that even though the apathy scale score was positive, the subjective impression was it's, the same it's not one person's perspective, it's the aggregate, but it was no different. And it may just be also, I mean, it's possible to function as the follow up being relatively short and some of the, like the emotional domains of apathy took a long time to start improving even in the study. So I think having the longer kind of term follow that we'll get in the new admin study could be helpful. I just wanted to direct people to the chat function on the Zoom um, platform. There's a, a comment posted by Heyman from, um, Providence. So thanks very much for joining us and for your comment. Amanda, did you want to address that? Sure, you know, I think it's a very interesting comment. Um, basically, just that the military population may have a higher baseline instance of EDD, which could potentially kind of affect how um, methylphenidate, um, methylphenidate is used in this population. So yeah, no, I, I didn't think of that before, but I think it's a very um, good comment. Um, and Shabir has his hand up to make a comment. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Doug, I just wanted to clarify. I thought, uh, and I don't remember the directionality of the scale, but in the methylphenidate paper, the clinical global impression scale for both improvement and severity was statistically significantly different between the active treatment arm and the placebo. Yeah, I was commenting on the presentation. I thought it was reported in the presentation is no different. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. I can go back to the... No, I'll pull it up now. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we'll try to figure out how to get back to the to Amanda's slide deck. Um, we better get going to head down to round those of us for Yeah, I have to look um, here. The overall scale is lower in the methylphenidate group versus placebo. Um, I, report the again. I'll look into that further. Oh, I, I have it up here. So I think the confusion is that there's the clinical global impressions improvement scale, and then there's the clinical global improvement or impression severity scale. So if we look at the clinical global impressions improvement scale, uh, there was a significant improvement at the four week and 12 week time uh, points. But if we look at the clinical global impression severity scale at four weeks, um, the confidence interval includes zero. So it wasn't significant, but by the time we got to 12 weeks, then it was. So there was that one time point at, at four weeks where, where there was no difference. Thank you. Very good. 
people are obviously reading the article and paying attention, so thank you so much. Yes, and this is a really germane as the apathy study from uh, Nathan Herman is still ongoing here at Sunnybrook, mm -hmm. and he's actively recruited. And you know, as I've cut down my clinic, and the memory clinic at Sunnybrook no longer is operating, he's really having challenge recruiting patients. Good Thank you. Too much apathy comments? in participating in the study. <laughs> <laughs> any final comments or questions? Very good then. Well, everyone enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining us at the Journal Club and hopefully you'll see the YouTube posting uh, shortly. Thanks very much everyone and thank you to the presenters. Great job.